Welcome to The Last Report. I'm Senator Mark Baggage. This show is designed to inform you about issues, programs, and people important to Alaska. Today I'm joined by one of my staff members, Elizabeth Wagner, and we are going to talk about the number of issues facing Congress and important to Alaskans between now and the end of the year. With the elections over and Congress back to work, many of the items that were bubbling up early this summer will be back before us. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Senator Bagich. It's good to be here, and I'm glad to be here and get to talk with you about some of the issues that you're going to be dealing with in the Senate for the rest of the year. So we'd like to focus here on, issue, on the issues that matter most to Alaskans, your constituents. And as you know, your offices, both in Alaska and here in Washington, D.C., get a bunch of uh, calls and emails and letters every week, hundreds of them every week, constituents contacting you about the issues that are going on. So I've compiled some of those issues for today's show, and we're like going to get your you take. That. A bunch. It a is bunch. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> we get a lot of them every week. Yeah, everybody's trying to contact you about the issues. That's right. So we want to talk about them here and get your take on what's going on and what we can expect to see for the rest of this congressional session. Excellent. Let's go. All right, let's get started. So one of the things we'd like to talk about first is tax cuts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have been contacting you about what some people are calling the Bush tax mm -hmm. cuts and the overall need for tax reform. So what's your take on what's going to happen with tax reform this year? Well, we tried to get to it a little bit before we took the uh, recess for elections and we couldn't get there. Uh, it's clear that we are going to have to deal with the Bush tax cuts, the extension of them. Uh, we'll be back, as you said, back after the session here or after the elections. And the, the key on these, there's kind of a big, uh, kind of a split. There's two parts. There's one is tax cuts for the middle class. And then there's the question of what do you do with the top 2% wage earners in this country, basically the millionaire club. Do we extend the tax cuts for them? Uh, I don't believe we should uh, because when you think about it, the 2% or the top 2%, it would cost an additional $700 billion of expense to the taxpayers, basically the middle class taxpayers paying for the top 2%. The other piece is uh, they're receiving that tax cut right now. And one of the arguments on the other side is if you have the 2%, uh, if you extend those for the wealthy, then the economy will keep chugging along and moving forward. And you need to do that in order to maintain the economy. My belief is they got that tax cut right now and they're not investing it. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at the data out there, the largest amount of cash held in corporations is right now, more than decades that have gone by. So the tax cut they want to extend for the wealthy to invest in the economy. They're not doing it now, and my view is we shouldn't extend it. But the bigger issue is the middle class tax cuts, and I believe those need to be extended. But on top of that, we have a bigger challenge. We need tax reform. Just extending these uh, middle class tax cuts for one or two years is inadequate. If we're serious about uh, making a fundamental change to impacting our tax system, I've supported a piece of legislation that Senator Wyden, a Democrat, and Senator Gregg, a Republican, Senator Bennett, a Republican, and myself have, have sponsored. Uh, it's called the Fair and Simplification Tax Reform. Very simple. If I, you know, my push is going to be, you know, now that we're back, not just spend the time on the extensions, but really do reform. It does three basic things. One, it takes the corporate rate down from the second highest in the world down to about midstream. So we're now more competitive on the global market. It takes the six individual rates for people like you and me, instead of six rates, down to three rates, 35%, 25%, 15%. And the best part of it is it takes all this for me and you when we felt these, you know, if you do our tax returns, mm -hmm. they're complicated, they're long, down to one page. Mm. So it lowers the corporate, makes us, us more competitive, gets rid of a bunch of corporate loopholes, uh, it then takes the private or individual rates, compresses them, lowers them, and then simplifies it. Net result is it's, it's budget neutral, meaning there's no additional cost, because we get rid of all these loopholes that corporations have been taking advantage of, but it creates a competitive advantage for us in the sense of uh, corporate rates and individual rates. Mm -hmm. And the best part is it extends it out. It's not just one or two years. It gives certainty. If you're a business, and you want to invest, a small business, and you want to invest you know, half a million dollars, two million, 10 million, 20 million, whatever that number might be, you want to look out 10 or 15 or 20 years. 
But if you just extend tax policy for one year, two years, you can't do it. There's no certainty. This tax reform policy that we've, I've just laid out here mm -hmm. is long term, have significant benefit, and it will help the middle class and deficit neutral. And the last thing I'll just say, two groups, the Heritage Foundation and the Brookings Institute, two opposite ends of the equation politically, mm -hmm. support this legislation mm -hmm. because they think it's the right thing to do. It's long-term reform. I hope that really we get to that. It's, it's fine to tinker with the extensions, but if we want to be serious, let's do reform. Hasn't been done since 1986. Let's impact business in the right way to be more competitive, help the middle class, and simplify it. I mean, I, I just, mm -hmm. you know, if you clean the deck with all these loopholes and simplify it, the average taxpayer, uh, one will be grateful they don't have to spend those long hours on the weekends before April 15th trying to fill out all that paperwork. <laughs> mm -hmm. They can do it very simply. Okay. So that's what I think is going to happen. We're going to deal with the tax extenders, but then there's going to be this big push for reform, and several of us are saying it's time to do the reform and do it right and do it now. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Well, let's move on to another issue that has been really big in Congress this year, and that is oil spill legislation. Yes. And kind of precipitated by the events that happened in the Gulf of Mexico this summer, mm -hmm. we saw a lot of attempts to get some sort of oil spill liability legislation passed. Nothing happened. Right. So what do you see coming up on that? Well, as you know, with the, um, the blowout that occurred down in the Gulf, the spill that occurred uh, really um, took or, you know, focused us on kind of what are we going to do? How are we going to clean that up? What's mm -hmm. the administration doing? There's a lot of debate. And as you said, one of the pieces that came out of that was liability. Mm -hmm. And it really is focused on economic liability because the oil companies are responsible for 100% cleanup costs under the current law. They're responsible for uh, punitive damage. In other words, if they uh, damage the water, which of course there is damage, they have responsibility for that. But the big piece was the very thin liability that was required for economic damage. When you think of the fishermen down in the Gulf and the businesses that were impacted, and why do we know it best? Because in Alaska we had this exact same thing happen. And the economic harm that happened to the Prince William Sound, it took 20 years to settle it, and it was only 10 cents on the dollar, which was outrageous, where the Supreme Court basically worked the wrong direction, did not do what uh, citizens had been waiting for, just, just compensation for economic damage. So here we are now in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it's getting cleaned up, things are happening, very positive since the spill and, and, and what's going on down there. But now we have to make sure the liability is clear, not only for this spill, but anything in the future. And so the result has been a piece of legislation we've worked on aggressively out of our office to ensure that taxpayers never have to pay for the liability or the cost for economic harm. Uh, two, that the oil companies in different sizes, meaning uh, you want to be careful that you don't drive the small ones out of business because you have huge liability on them, uh, but they have responsibility, mm -hmm. as well as the large ones. So we've designed a piece of legislation that I believe reaches all those goals. Taxpayers not to be on the hook for one dime. Two, it's a kind of a joint pool of insurance, meaning small and large jointly participate, with the large companies carrying a heavier burden, mainly because mm -hmm. they have more production. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a process that uh, makes sure that if at the end of the day the spill is significant in size, like we are experiencing now in the Gulf, that there is a requirement to put some aside while the liability is being determined in an escrow account. Very similar to what we're doing now in the Gulf. We think this is an important piece of legislation. Its long-term impact uh, will protect the taxpayer, protect the country, and ensure that there's a defined liability. The petroleum, uh, several people within the petroleum industry, the organizations, uh, like the direction we've gone because it's rational. Uh, I will say that that wasn't necessarily the case when some was brought forward earlier this year. There was mm -hmm. a couple groups that were kind of on both ends of the equation. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get there. So we came in and tried to figure out how to get the compromise, make sure taxpayers are protected, oil companies share the risk within their own organizations, and we now have folks from the industry supporting the concept that we're headed. We hope this, you know, as we're back now, we get the energy legislation, that we will have this discussion and insert this as part of the broader energy policy of this country. Mm -hmm. Great. So how do you see any future energy legislation affecting Alaska in particular and the future of oil and gas development in Alaska? 
Well, you know, I, I, I was more optimistic before the elections about oil, in, uh, you know, some sort of oil policy, oil and gas policy, energy policy. Um, now the elections are done, I'm still somewhat optimistic, but mm -hmm. because we have so many pressing issues before the end of the year, I'm not, I don't think we'll get to it by the end of the year, mm -hmm. but I do believe that we will hit, uh, by the beginning of the next year, an energy policy. We, we have to do it. It's in our economic interest. It's in our national security interest. You know, we're buying oil from countries that just do not like us when you think about it. Iran, Nigeria, Venezuela, these are just some of the countries we buy oil and gas from. And we, of course, buy some from countries that do like us, like Canada and Mexico. But the fact is, we're doing business with countries that don't like us and work against us. It is in our interest to figure out a broad range energy policy that focuses on domestic production, alternative energy, and renewable energy. If we can do that, we will be a much more secure nation as we move forward, but also it's the new economy. I mean, the energy potential is unbelievable with the renewable energy, the, the projects that you can do. In Alaska, when you look at western Alaska with all the wind energy capacity, some of the villages I've been to where I've seen the wind farms that have put up, or in Kodiak where it's almost 90% renewable energy driven now, where that wasn't the case 10 years ago. Or you go down to southeast with the hydro projects that are going on. We have enormous potential in the state of Alaska and also in this country. And I think if we spend our time focused on that, uh, we'll be uh, better off long term. Mm -hmm. OCS, Outer Continental Shelf Development, mm -hmm. the Gulf has caused kind of a pause. We've been pretty aggressive with the president. Uh, I think he's his, he and his folks are wrong on putting a moratorium on Alaska. We need to move forward. We think and believe we have the right safeguards in the Arctic. We have more work to do, there's no question about it. But I think we have some of the more responsible companies doing the work up there. And that is our future. One third of the gas supply in this country is in the Gulf of Alaska, or in the Chukchi, Beaufort Sea, one mm -hmm. third. When you think about clean burning fuel, alternative fuel, gas is an incredible part of that equation. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're aggressive. Uh, you'll hear a lot about it from me over the next 30 to 45 days before the year's out, mm -hmm. because I think the Obama administration is wrong here to put a moratorium on. We need to move forward. We will do it the responsible way. And all we want from the Obama administration is tell us the rules, Tell us the timeline, and we'll get busy and meet those obligations, and we will do it right for our state and for our country. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we are in this broad energy. Energy is one of those things that you could spend a whole show on because sure. yeah. it's so critical for us from a national security, energy security, economic security. And for Alaska, mm -hmm. it's big business and it's jobs, not only jobs today, but into the future. Yeah. Well, I know we're going to be right back here, Elizabeth. We are uh, take a little break. Take mm -hmm. a little break. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of issues, and you're doing great. I'm <laughs> glad you're uh, doing this with me today. It gives a chance for the folks watching us to see the many issues uh, that we face as Alaskans that are connected to our national economy mm -hmm. and the world economy. So we'll take a short break here, and we'll come back, and we'll. I'm sure you have. I don't know what your whole list is I there, but I can see it's a long one. Yep. <laughs> so I'll look forward to it. All so right. again, viewers, we'll be right back, and uh, we'll have a shopping list of more questions that Elizabeth will pepper me with, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them all. G morning, sunshine. Text me back. LUV, love you. JK. Holla back. Holla back. <laughs> Are you with your friends? That's lame. We're in a huge fight right now. XO. What'd you XO. dream about? Something I did. Are you on your way to the mall? Lonely. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. There's this guy. Oh, it's in my face. Shout at me. Just pushes me. But I love him. He's my coach. My coach. Be a coach. Be a fan. Special Olympics. There it is, God. Welcome back to Alaska Report. I'm Senator Mark Baggage. Today I'm joined by one of my staff members, Elizabeth Wagner. And we are talking about some of the issues Alaskans call or write our office about, issues facing Congress in the coming days before the end of the year. And, 
And uh, we talked just before the break on energy and tax policy. And I know mm -hmm. I joked with Elizabeth that she has a, a long list. I kind of looked over her list. <laughs> I just kind of glanced and it's like a whole page. <laughs> so uh, let's start talking let's about go. these issues. Go for it. All right, so one of the things that people in Alaska are really concerned about is this idea of frankenfish, as yeah. you've called it, the idea of genetically engineering salmon. You're right. And of course, salmon are so important to us in Alaska. And I know that most people in Alaska, and you, are pretty opposed to that idea. That's right. So are you going to introduce legislation, or what are you going to do to stop the frankenfish? Well, frankenfish is, you know, it's funny when uh, first came out about uh, genetically engineered salmon, you know, w within a short bit. Matter of fact, as you know, in our office, Shana Toma, who works out of the Anchorage office, mm -hmm. said she called it frankenfish. And I said, that's a great title. We'll yeah. call it frankenfish because, honestly, genetically engineered salmon, I have no faith that the uh, FDA will do the right regulatory process on this, which means mm -hmm. uh, what kind of unhealthy product might come out of the out of the design or development of it. Also, from Alaska's perspective, uh, it's we have no interest in seeing another product like that enter the market. That is, uh, you know, it's frankenfish. It's fake fish. And the fact is, we have incredible product. We spend decades marketing, uh, showing. Um, not only the Alaska market, but the domestic market and the international market, mm -hmm. why our salmon is the best when it comes to wild caught salmon. Plus it's a big industry, as you know. 62% of all fish caught in this country come from Alaska. Mm. So we are, a, you know, literally the fish basket of America. And now to introduce a genetically engineered product, uh, I think is gonna damage the market. Uh, also put uh, inferior product on the market. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they say. I mean, it's basically cloning fish, and I'm just not uh, interested in that. Interesting note, I came back from Alaska, met with some folks in Homer in Southeast Alaska. They are outraged um, by this action, uh, mm -hmm. that FDA may approve this. So what we hope to do, and, and I'll have the legislation to do this, is one, not to allow it, is the first piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. The second is, if it is allowed, that it has to be labeled. You know, and the company, of course, says, well, we don't need to label it. And my attitude is, well, if you think it's such a great product, why not label it? Yeah, why not tell, tell the people? people what it is. That's mm -hmm. right, because they're going to put it, r I guarantee you what they're going to do. They're going to put their fish right next to our great Alaska fish mm -hmm. and our wild caught salmon, and they're going to try to let people assume it's similar. They won't say it's similar, mm -hmm. but they'll try to make it assume that it's similar. And that's why I believe. It should be clearly labeled. Yeah. Uh, if it if it's approved, then label it, mm -hmm. and then we'll let the market make the determination of whose product is better. You know, of course, you know I'm biased. I'm sure you're biased. Alaska salmon is going to beat out everybody, but the first goal is you know have FDA not approve this product. If they do, then we need to get it labeled. Congressman Young has similar legislation, and I, we're on the same page on this. Mm -hmm. And I I'm agitated and frustrated that FDA has moved forward with minimal public comment. Once we kind of stirred it up, suddenly a lot of people have entered the equation. Mm -hmm. But again, frankenfish is one of those things that I would tell Alaskans, of course, never buy it. Uh, tell your friends that it's genetically engineered and it's not comparable at all to Alaska salmon. Yeah. And you were really leading the fight on that. So we're, we're as we say, we're plowing issue. through it. Yeah. And now they use frankenfish. I've seen in some European newspapers they call it frankenfish. So we know it. Yeah, you know, it you, sticks. Yeah, Alaska yeah, has coined has the phrase, yeah. and bam, yeah. it's gone everywhere. Yeah. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about education. Mm -hmm. um, so the No Child Left Behind. Act is going to be rewritten. Yes, and you're going to get involved in that, right? And uh, try to sort of tailor it to what Alaska needs. That's right. In an education bill. Yeah, the um, uh, No Child Left Behind Act is now up for they call reauthorization. Mm -hmm. Reauthorization is this process that when a piece of legislation passes, it kind of goes through a process of so many years of it being used, and then it's sunsets or it has to be reauthorized, mm -hmm. and then it comes back. And usually. Reauthorize authorization is they kill off the bill mm -hmm. or they modify it. In this case, they want to modify it. If I had my druthers, I'd kill off the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I think it has mm -hmm. damaged Alaska. It has not been good uh, for uh, rural Alaska. It has not done what we expected it to do. No one disagrees with having higher quality standards because we are way behind uh, when it comes to education standards in the sense of engineering and math. I and mean, we're losing the ground against the world markets. But 
No Child Left Behind was a nice title. It sounded good, but it, it left a lot of kids behind, especially in rural Alaska. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we hope to do, uh, we're not on the health committee, the health, health education, labor, and pension committee, which manages this bill, but because um, it touches Alaska, as you know, our policy in our office is any bill that touches Alaska, mm -hmm. we engage. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not our committee that we're on, we are going to engage, we're going to come in there, and we're going to give our input. So we met a few months ago with a round table of Alaskans you know, from all walks of life with regards to education. We heard, uh, got from them kind of their feedback. What do they want to see change? What are the improvements they want? Made a pretty significant list, and I think this is now on our website because we sent a letter to our chair, the chairman of the committee, and said, "You, we are not going to support this legislation unless it has these kind of Alaskan provisions, recognizing you can have a certain program in, you know, Chivak, Alaska, or uh, Tuksuk Bay that's going to be different than Juneau or Anchorage or Nikiski or mm -hmm. Homer and Attu. I mean, you name it; they're all different." And what we have to do is make sure that we create the flexibility to work in these unique environments. And what works in Anchorage, for example, is not going to work in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that. So that's the idea. A lot of amendments, but I'll, I'll tell you, Alaskans really gave us a lot of good ideas on that. Along with that, we've introduced two pieces of legislation. One called STEM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. As I said earlier, we're way behind in this global economy now where our kids are placing. We're down the double digits now. We're not one and two anymore. A lot of people think we still are. We're not. We're so mm -hmm. far down it's unbelievable. This puts resources, and it's a paid for bill, meaning there's resources to pay for it, um, to ensure that we get ahead of the game here in these in critical fields for us to be competitive in the world market. The second one is another small bill to create innovation, allowing schools on their local level to do what they think is a very innovative program and then give them some resources to help them uh, model that and maybe export to other communities. But we know the best ideas are not going to come from Washington DC at the Education Department building. They're going to come from folks working every day in the villages and towns and cities across Alaska. And that's what we want to do. We want to invest there so they can create the best programming where they engage parents, teachers, kids at the local level. So we'll, we'll work to get those included inside um, uh, the larger No Child Left Behind uh, rea reauthorization bill. Mm -hmm. Great. So now, what about the Recovery Act? A lot of people contact your office and they're concerned about what this bill you is actually so politely. doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People are concerned about spending and they right. want to know what's the Recovery Act actually doing in yeah. Alaska? You know, so the Recovery Act, it, it's, if you ask every pollster, uh, the pollsters will tell you, never talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, don't get away from it. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the fact is, you know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, this economy, not only in Alaska, and we were kind of fragile, but not like the rest of the country, was mm -hmm. just devastated. So we worked very aggressively, and I worked with the um, bipartisan group, a small group of us, about eight or nine of us, to craft that final bill. That bill ended up, uh, I believe, doing what exactly what we wanted to do, put a little juice in the economy. Um, it gave some relief to local governments. It gave almost 300, as, it's, as it finally pays out over time, about $300 billion in tax relief to middle class Americans. The problem is no one saw that because it mostly came through your payroll check, so we probably got two calls on it. <laughs> but the big part is the capital investment, investing in roads and water and sewer and bridges and all the things that really are critical to move our economy forward. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a lot of criticism because people w thought it was a lot of big spending. Here, here's the facts. I mean, I look at Alaska. We're going to get about $2 billion uh, from the stimulus money as it's finished out. It's the highest per capita mm -hmm. uh, in the nation. I'd look to the audience. Don't tell anyone outside of Alaska that we have the highest per, per capita per in the nation because we don't want them to think that we got too much. Mm -hmm. But what do we do with it? We put it to work. In Nome, Alaska, they're building a new hospital, which will employ, it's $152 million. It will employ 170 new medical professionals. It will provide health care to a desperately needed area, triple the size. It's, I mean, it's all needed. It's not like fluff work. Mm -hmm. These are Alaskan jobs, Alaskan workers, not only constructing it, but also obviously employed in it afterwards. 
or you go down to southeast. Wrangell, Alaska is now has a loan guarantee from the Recovery Act that allows them to build their Wrangell Hospital. Again, a regional uh, effort. Also jobs that are high paying jobs that take the place of some of these timber jobs that we had lost over the years. Again, a, really a project that is, is well worth it. Or the Fairweather, which is a NOAA vessel docked in Nome, now has four new attached vessels to it to the tune of almost $8 million mm -hmm. investment. Why is that vessel so important and those uh, other four that are attached to it? Because they do the surveys of the coastline for the fishermen, for the transportation groups, to know where everything is so you don't run aground. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very important for us. Um, they do a lot of other research and scientific work. Or you go to South Central. We have $50 million being invested in the wind energy project, which will bring 4% of the power to all of South Central or the elder housing in, in Ketchikan. I mean, the list goes on mm -hmm. and on. Mm -hmm. And my favorite intersection, and everyone knows it, Lake Otis and Tudor, it was completed with $5 million of recovery money. Now you can go through that intersection and it's smooth as silk. So it's working. It's employing people, has long-term impact, repairing infrastructure that's been critically needed. And people who criticize it or say nothing's been done, uh, just they don't see the facts and they're mm -hmm. just not being realistic. Mm -hmm. I understand the politics of it. But let's look at what's really going on. Now, how, maybe how other states use their money may be a little different, but in Alaska, we put it to work building things, employing people, and making sure we build an infrastructure that we can drive economic investment off of in the future. Yeah, so, so you can actually see those recovery dollars Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I tell people, anytime you drive in Anchorage, you drive through Lake Otis and Tudor, you'll feel it. If you're in Fairbanks and you get on the Van Pool program, you feel it. You go to Nome and get hospital treatment, you're getting it. Yeah, yeah. So now I noticed you talked about working in a bipartisan group on the Recovery Act. Um, a lot of people contact your office with concerns about gridlock in Congress yeah. and how everything is so partisan and nobody's getting anything done. Do you think we can expect that to get better in the future or what do you see happening? Well now the elections are done, maybe people will be more calm, mm -hmm. collective and focus on what's right and we're going to have our differences. You know, the challenge of ideas between Democrats and Republicans, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what makes the final idea or the final product better when you challenge each other. But if we're just going to challenge it because we want to win an election, then the country loses, mm -hmm. America loses, Alaskans lose. So we really have to hone in on what, what do you want to focus on? Tax reform, job creation, getting our budget passed, and fixing government so it works for the people. I think these are simple things, but we've got to find that common thread, work toward it, and make things happen. Mm -hmm. I am optimistic. I'm always optimistic, and so we'll see when maybe the first of the year, and we'll see how it all works yeah, out. Yeah. Elizabeth, you did a great job, uh, and I hope my, uh, the viewers feel the same way. We want to thank Elizabeth for her work, but also being here today. And uh, again, to the viewing audience, thank you for tuning in to us and hearing about all the issues that we're facing in Congress today. Enjoy the day. Look forward to talking to you again soon.